uh, Conworth, uh, Mr. Justice Bukhari, uh, Professor Hazel Gend, uh, distinguished guests, uh, members of the judiciary, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so first of all, um, let me first welcome everyone to join us this morning uh, uh, for the UCL Hong Kong U Conference on Administrative Law. Um, this is the fourth or probably sixth uh, collaboration between Hong Kong U and UCL in the last few years. Uh, and we are very pleased that uh, today we focus on a, a, a very timely and contemporary topic uh, on administrative law or sp and specific issues here. And judicial review, of course, starts as uh, uh, in its origin, the exercise of the judicial supervisory power over public body inferior tribunal to ensure uh, that the public body and inferior tribunal act within the confines of law, uh, and it is the foundation for the rule of law. And in a politically more stable environment, judicial review serves the function of fine-tuning public governance uh, of the government and the executive. Uh, but at times of a more volatile uh, political setting and constitutional changes, judicial review could be more disturbing. Uh, and in Hong Kong, uh, judicial review is probably the worst nightmare of a civil servant. Uh, they hate judicial review, and a successful judicial review could mean the end of a career. Uh, and for the social advocates, judicial review is increasingly seen as a means for social changes. And for the civil libertarians, judicial review is not only to curb the, the excess of executive or legislation, but also a push uh, to expand uh, the confines of civil liberties, human rights, and so on. So in a way, the court in such a political, uh, volatile political setting, uh, the court uh, is facing um, pressures in a way from all walks uh, and different type of expectations on the court. Uh, and of course, the court is only answerable to the law and to the law alone. Uh, but then among underlying all these, uh, in a way is a perennial problem that has been running for over 100 years is how far judicial review can go. Uh, in the early 20th century, uh, when we have the checkers debate on the justiciability, what organs are subject to judicial review, to the development of awareness free unreasonableness in the 60s, in the last century, uh, and more recently to proportionality. These are in a way all judicial attempts trying to define the boundary of judicial review uh, and its relationship vis-a-vis -vis the executive government. And with the advent of constitutional judicial review, uh, a further dimension uh, comes which raises the issues of the relationship between the judiciary and the legislature. Uh, there are various formulas uh, which have been trying uh, in the past to define the precise scope, whether we call it Wednesday, uh, deference, margin of appreciation, uh, and more lately from our Court of Appeal, uh, ma manifestly without reasonable foundations. Uh, and we'd like to have a look at all these uh, and underlying this how to place the judiciary within the wider concept of separation of powers uh, and how uh, these could change with time in a way. Uh, and at the same time in this seminars, we are also trying to focus on something outside the judicial review, with, still with the same theme, uh, judicial review and prosecution. Uh, judicial review and the legislature, apart from reviewing the legislation, the product of legislature, but the actual operation of the legislature, this exercise uh, of investigative power under a standing committee, under the power and privileges bill and so on, uh, what should belong to the legislature and what should belong to the judiciary. Um, so, uh, and, and finally, uh, we also like to explore in recent years is if judicial review uh, in a way is used as a means of social change or an engineering for social changes, uh, in particular faced with massive judicial review, test cases, and so on. How could the judiciary respond to that? How could these things be managed? Uh, and what lessons could be learned from other jurisdictions, particularly the UK? Uh, so we are glad to gather a group of experts today uh, that they can share uh, their expert analysis with us. 
And in particular, I'd like to thank Lord Carnesworth uh, for uh, taking uh, a trip to, firstly to Beijing and then to Hong Kong to join us uh, on this very occasion. Uh, as I said earlier, this is the, the fourth or sixth UCL Hong Kong U collaborations uh, in the last few years. Uh, we have been working on a wide range of issues uh, from civil justice reform to competition law to environmental law and now to administrative law. Uh, we've done two rule of law conference in Beijing uh, in detail. The latest one is with Beijing University just last week, uh, where uh, Lord Canworth preside over a, a, a mock trial in Beijing U, which is very well responsed, uh, where we discuss the rule of law issues uh, in Beijing. Uh, so we look forward again to this very uh, uh, deep collaborations, uh, and it is a particular pleasing uh, to see uh, the strong collaboration between UCL and Hong Kong U in almost all fields, uh, and like to thanks of good friend, uh, Professor Dane Hazel Yant, uh, for making this possible. Uh, and a conference of this kind would not be possible without the support, uh, not only of academics, but also of our friends uh, and supporters. And in particular, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Winston Chu, uh, who is a veteran supporter of both UCL and Hong Kong U, uh, and the Winston Chu and Foundations, uh, which makes this uh, conference possible. Uh, and finally, of course, uh, a conference of this kind requires the works of a lot of people behind the scene and all the administrators and my colleagues who make things work and smooth. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of them. Uh, and if there's any credit, they should take the credit. Uh, if anything wrong, I should take the blame. Uh, and with that remark, I'd like to thank you all and look forward to an interesting and stimulating discussions today. Thank you very much. Um, if I may now ask uh, uh, Professor Dame Hazel again to say a few words as well. Uh, Hazel? Thank you. Thanks, Johannes. Um, I think Johannes has just very eloquently said everything that I had noted down that I was going to say. Uh, so I will just say that I'm delighted to be here with a team from UCL and with Lord Carnworth uh, to discuss a topic of common concern in both jurisdictions. Um, as Johannes said, we've had several um, successful collaborations between UCL and Hong Kong U. Uh, in 2010 on civil justice when um, Lord Newberger and Sir Rupert Jackson came with us, uh, 2012 in Beijing when Lord Justice Goldring, the senior presiding judge, came, and now in 2014 where we've had a conference in Beijing and this conference here now with Lord Carnworth. Uh, we very much value the partnership uh, with Hong Kong U, and I want to say that I personally have valued the collaboration with Johannes Chan, and I'm very sorry to realize but actually, this is probably the last collaboration with him as Dean of Hong Kong U. Uh, I have much enjoyed working with you, and I will look forward to working with your successor, Michael Hoare, who I believe takes up his role in uh, July. Uh, and I'm sure that the collaboration, the partnership between UCL and Hong Kong U will continue and go to, from strength to strength. And I hope that Johannes will still be part of that, even though he will be relieved of the burdens of uh, uh, the life as a Dean. Um, I also want to say that a constant feature uh, in the background of this partnership between uh, UCL and Hong Kong U has been the support of Winston Chu and the Vincent Chu Foundation. Winston Chu is a UCL alum. He's also a visiting professor at UCL, so I am therefore his boss, uh, which he uh, regularly points out to people, which I remind people <laughs> all the time. He's been a fantastic support. Uh, he has been behind many of the conferences, both in terms of ideas and also tangible support. We could not have had these conferences without uh, the support of Winston and the Vincent Chu Foundation. I should also say that, Vince, uh, that Winston gave the most marvelous lecture at UCL a while ago on uh, his activities in protecting the harbor. And people at UCL, UCL still remember that as being uh, an important high spot and some, uh, something from which they learned a lot. So our deep gratitude to you, Winston, and I hope that we will continue to enjoy your friendship uh, and support in the future. Uh, before uh, stopping speaking, I would like to introduce um, the team from UCL, Kimberly Trapp. Kimberly, do you just want to show yourself, who you'll see later, who uh, is a lecturer at UCL and was with us in uh, Beijing, and Alex Mills, who's here, who'll be talking to you later. Uh, who uh, has just come for the Hong Kong conference. Uh, and finally, I want to pay tribute to Lord Carnworth. It is most unusual for a, super, a justice of the Supreme Court to be able to take time away from sitting to come to attend these kinds of academic events. It has been absolutely invaluable. He's made the most marvelous contribution in Beijing 
and I very much look forward to he hearing from you here. Thank you very much for taking the time out to do this. Thank you. So enjoy the day. I know that I will. Thank you very much. And we are particularly privileged and honoured uh, that uh, we will start this conference with a keynote address from Mr. Justice, uh, from Lord Carnworth uh, of the Supreme Court of UK. We are also particularly privileged that uh, Mr. Justice Bukhari, uh, um, currently non-permanent judge of our Court of Final Appeals, uh, who has agreed to introduce Lord Carnworth and to preside over the keynote uh, speech. So if I may invite Lord Carnworth and Mr. Justice Bukhari uh, onto the panel first. been asked to uh, introduce Lord Carnworth. He, of course, needs uh, no introduction, and that may be a very good reason why I am relieved of my duty, but it is no reason whatsoever that I should deprive myself of the pleasure. Indulging this pleasure, I must bear in mind that uh, every word which I speak uh, will postpone the pleasure to which we all look forward to, uh, that of hearing Lord Carnworth. Uh, let me therefore say simply this, that his uh, credentials uh, are perfect after a distinguished practice at the bar including as uh, junior counsel to the revenue, and of course as a very distinguished Queen's counsel, he has on the bench been successively a judge of the Chancery Division, a Lord Justice of Appeal, and now a Justice of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. In addition to that, uh, he has served as chairman of the Law Commission, uh, a body from which Hong Kong can learn a great deal. Perhaps the most important thing to learn is to have a Law Commission rather than to make do with the uh, rather informal arrangement we have in that regard. Lord Carnworth also served as a senior president of tribunals. It is impossible to think of any speaker who would be better qualified to say the things which we all look forward to hearing him say and which we must not postpone one minute longer. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for those very kind remarks, which set me a high test. It's a, a great pleasure for me to be back in Hong Kong. Um, I first came here in 1988. Um, it was something of a baptism of fire. I came to do a case which was supposed to last six weeks and ended up taking two years. <laughs> and during that period, I learned a lot about the uh, ups and downs of the um, Hong Kong judicial system as it then was, and also came to be very, very interested and develop a great affection for Hong Kong. <clears throat> uh, the other thing I should perhaps just say by way of introduction is that I'm here in a dual capacity. Um, Hazel didn't mention this, but one of the things that uh, brought me here was the fact that my choir, the Bach Choir, is actually singing in um, Hong Kong later this week. This is a little advertisement. If any of you are free on Friday or... <laughs> Saturday night, we're singing the Matthew Passion of Bach at the Cultural Center. Um, uh, and we've been singing, uh, I had, I, we had this fascinating day in Beijing uh, doing the mock trial, and then I also was privileged to visit the 
uh, Supreme People's Court and other high-ranking officials. And I then went on to Shanghai, where we sang the concert with the choir, and then Hangzhou. And I think they, they, they went well. It, it, I was quite lucky to get here, because when I was applying for my visa, the Chinese authorities had some difficulty coping with the idea of a singing judge. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't fit into any, any of their categories, so I, I only got my visa a couple of days before I came out. Um, we, I mean, the, the concert went very well, I think. We, the great success was uh, we, had be, we had been told that we ought to try and sing something Chinese, and we were given this, what we were told was a Chinese folk song. Um, we spent quite a lot of time trying to learn the sort of pronunciation. <laughs> but it's not easy if you're, not, if you're trying to sing. In, uh, uh, anyway, there's a song called Moli Loire. Does anyone know Moli Loire? It's all about, apparently it's all about a jasmine flower, and it's, as far as told. Anyway, when we start, we, we've been singing this quite solemn program of sort of Western music, and we went into the encore of Moli Loire, and everyone clapped and joined in. It was a very exciting. So, Anyway, here I am, back to rather more mundane things. Um, I, this is a bit of a journey down memory lane for me, uh, going back to my days when I started at the bar in the early 70s, and then coming through full circle. Um, in my early days at the English bar, back in the early 1970s, Winsbury ruled. I remember being a little surprised that this somewhat obscure town in the West Midlands should have come to play such a central part in our public law. The concept, concept of Winsbury unreasonableness had become and still is so ingrained in our thinking that we've tended to forget what the case was about. Let me remind you. The Winsbury Council had taken upon itself to decree by a license condition that children under 15 should not be allowed to attend the local Gaumont cinema on Sundays, even if accompanied by their parents, and whatever the nature of the film. That was in spite of the fact that Parliament in the Sunday Entertainments Act 1932 had authorized cinemas to open on Sundays, notwithstanding anything in any enactment relating to Sunday observance. Now, of course, the Council had a general power to impose conditions on cinema licenses, but one might have thought that was intended to allow it to lay down safety standards and the like, rather than to impose the council's view of how parents should entertain their own children in their free time. The cinema's case failed in the Court of Appeal. Counsel for the authority was not even called upon. In a somewhat rambling judgment, it has to be said, Lord Green explained why he thought the argument hopeless. It was based on a misconception of the powers of the court to intervene in such decisions. Unreasonableness as a ground of review meant that the authority must direct itself properly in law, calling to its attention matters which it is bound to consider and excluding irrelevant matters. And it must not reach a decision, quote, so unreasonable that no reasonable authority could ever come to it. That required, quote, something overwhelming the Wensbury Council, in the, the opinion of the court, were far from that threshold. No one, said Lord Green, at this time of day could say that the well-being and the physical and moral health of children is not a matter which a local authority can properly have in mind. And, and that was it. There was no mention in the judgment of any evidence from the council. Apparently the court did not think it necessary to inquire what business it was of the council to be telling parents what to do with their children in their free time, or what export expertise the authority had in the matter, or why they thought that Sunday cinema with their parents was of such a bad thing for children, or indeed what the children would be doing instead. And I suspect that nowadays we'd be quite pleased to think that children might want to spend some time with their parents going to the cinema on, on a Sunday rather than doing their own thing. But anyway, that was the view of the court talk, and that was it. Um, now, that was the sort of prevailing wisdom when I came to the bar in 1970, and it continued, really, for some years. The next sort of stepping stone, as it were, was 
the, in, in November 1984, when um, Lord Diplock restated uh, the Wednesday test in the famous CCSU case as part of his trilogy of um, grounds for judicial review, that is illegality, irrationality, and procedural impropriety. The, um, in his formulation, Winsby unreasonableness had become irrationality. Now, it's true that the subject matter then was rather more weighty than the Winsbury case. In that case, national security is a reason for removing without prior consultation the trade rights of workers at the trade union rights of workers at the government's GCHQ communication center. The challenge to the government's restrictions failed. But this time, at least, the government was expected to provide convincing evidence in support of its case that advance notice would attract disruptive action prejudicial to national security. There are, of course, many things in Lord Diplock's speech to admire. But as I thought then and think now, his definition of irrationality made very little sense at all. What he said was this, by irrationality, I mean what can now be succinctly referred to as Wensbury unreasonableness. It applies to a decision which is so outrageous in its defiance of logic or of accepted moral standards that no sensible person who had applied his mind to the question to be decided could have arrived at it. Now, what does all that mean? so outrageous. How, I wondered at the time, could such a subjective and emotional reaction as outrage be an appropriate part of the judicial armory? Our watchwords are dispassionate and objective appraisal, not outrage. Uh, and why moral standards? There may be many ways in which the conduct of public authorities can be morally objectionable, bribery, corruption, and so on. Such activities may be illegal, but not because they are irrational, still less because judges find them outrageous. So it wasn't really a test which, when you analyzed, helped you very much. And on any view, Lord Diplock was setting a very high threshold. In an article in 1993, John Laws, as a very new High Court judge, criticized the irrationality test as unacceptably monolithic memorably equating it with, quotes, a crude duty not to emulate the brute beasts that have no understanding. Professor Paul Craig has observed that if one takes the Diplock test at face value, there can be no pretense of any meaningful substantive review, and it is difficult to think of a single real case in which the facts meet this standard. Even Lord Green's famous example of the teacher sacked by an educational authority because he has red hair does not need judicial outrage to explain it. It is a simple example of taking account of a factor which is irrelevant to the authority's statutory function. Fortunately, perhaps, judicial outrage did not survive as a test of legality. The word irrationality itself has been used as a synonym for Wensby unreasonableness, but usually ignoring Lord Diplock's definition. In the first cases in which the House returned to this subject matter, Nothing was said of irrationality, let alone of judicial outrage. In Preston, April 1985, Lord Scarman and Lord Templeman resorted to the language of unfairness and abuse of power. In Wheeler and Leicester, July 1985, Lord Roscoe went back to, quotes, unreasonable in the Wensbury sense. And in Bryn, 1991, Lord Ackner applied a novel hybrid which he called the Wensbury Irrational Test. He said nothing about outrage or logic or morals. It's also clear that in practice, judges, at least in more recent times, have not felt unduly constrained by Lord Diplock's definition. In an article in 2004, Professor Andrew Lesueur looked at a sample of 41 judicial review cases decided in the English courts between January 2000 and July 2003, where decisions were challenged on the grounds of unreasonable he found a surprisingly high success rate. 18 out of 41 were successful. I can take one colorful example involving the somewhat esoteric subject of a statutory scheme designed to compensate farmers whose businesses were damaged by the Fur Farming Prohibition Act. The scheme provided compensation for breeding females, but not for breeding males. This was challenged by a mink farmer who pointed out that the former were not much use without the latter. 
and it was unfair and illogical to distinguish between them. The court agreed, as a judge said succinctly, to state the obvious, breeding requires both male and female animals, the justification is irrational. Now that's a sort of simple approach. If the judge was outraged, he did not find it necessary to say so, the distinction was not so much outrageous as silly. Lesueur cites plenty of other decisions where the court was able to reach a sensible result without overstating the test. The editors of the New De Smith have re similarly signaled a, more, a move away from the line taken in early editions that unreasonableness required something overwhelming. They said this, trawling through the case law that had developed by the 1990s, we found that a relatively large number of cases where the decision was held to be unreasonable. Deeper analysis revealed that in virtually every instance, the decision could have been held unlawful on the ground of a much more specific tenet or principle of substantial judicial review. Lord Diplock's attempted restatement was not in any event a true reflection of how the law had in fact developed in the preceding years since Lord Green's judgment. Those were indeed years of fruitful development of the principles of administrative law. The judges had been finding practical solutions to real cases, and finding distinct legal hooks to hang them on. I can still remember the cases that made a particular impact in my early years in the law. Hadfield, 1968, established the principle that there are no unfettered discretions in public law, and that statutory powers must be used to promote the policy and objects of the statute determined by the courts as a matter of law. Much of what follows can be traced back to that fundamental principle. Others that I remember from that period are Lavender, 1970, no fettering of planning discretions, Colleen Properties, 1971, decisions must be supported by substantial evidence, Congreve, 1976, abuse of license revocation powers, Thameside, 1977, duty of authorities to inform themselves, and the Hong Kong case, 1983, legitimate expectation. <coughs> now, in these cases, the judges were not applying some generalized test of irrationality or illegality. There was no need to seek to squeeze the cases into one of Lord Diplock's three categories. Rather, the judge's approach was much closer to the characteristically pragmatic approach suggested by Lord Donaldson in 1988 by way of a response to Lord Diplock. Lord Donaldson said this, the ultimate question would all, as always be whether something had gone wrong of a nature and degree which required the intervention of the court, and if so, what form that intervention should take. That, in effect, was a line that we took much more recently in the Court of Appeal in considering mistake of fact as a ground of review in E.V. the Secretary of State, 2004. We saw that judges at first instance had in practice been overturning administrative decisions for mistake of fact, particularly in planning and immigration cases, without going so far as to say the decisions were perverse or outrageous, and that the higher courts and the academics had not cried foul. So we decided to formulate some principles based not on unreasonableness or irrationality, but taking our cue from Lord Templeman in Preston, the basis of simple unfairness. Going back to CCSU, of more interest to modernize was Lord Diplock's suggestion that further development of the law on quote, a case-by-case -case basis might lead to new additions to his trilogy, such as the principle of proportionality as recognized in the laws of other members of the European community. The seeds of such a development, though not apparent at the time, were sown two years later in the use of another emotion phrase, this time, emotion based phrase, this time by Lord Bridge in an asylum case, RV Secretary of State, ex parte Bugde K. What he said was this The most fundamental of all human rights is the individual's right to life. And when an administrative decision under challenge is said to be one which may put the applicant's life at risk, the basis of the decision must surely call for the most anxious scrutiny. The attention later given to this passage might, I think, have surprised Lord Brick. Given the care with which his judgments were constructed, I doubt if he intended such an imprecise and subjective term as anxious scrutiny to acquire the status of a definition or legal principle. 
The next important case on this theme in the House of Lords was Brint in 1991, involving an alleged restriction on free speech. Lord Bridge himself did not say anything about anxious scrutiny. Rather, he spoke of the need where fundamental human rights are at stake to, quote, start from the premise that any restriction requires to be justified, and that nothing less than an importing competing public interest will be sufficient to justify it, those quotes. Now, that in modern terms seems very like the language of proportionality, even if he did not use that word, and the majority rejected the invitation of counsel to embrace proportionality into the common law. It, it is perhaps worth reminding ourselves of what at, was actually decided in Bug Day K. As so often, a particular phrase has acquired a life of its own without regard to its context. Anxious scrutiny was, in fact, relevant to only one of the group of consider cases considered at that time, that of a Mr. Mazuzi, a Ugandan citizen who had come to the UK from Kenya. The Secretary of State accepted that he could not be safely returned to Uganda, but proposed to return him to Kenya. The issue raised for the first time in the House of Lords was whether the Secretary of State had reasonably satisfied himself that Kenya had not itself returned him to Uganda as on the applicant's evidence had happened in some previous cases. So it was not enough for the Home Office's affidavit to express confidence that Kenya would not knowingly act in breach of the Refugee Convention without addressing the occasions when, according to the applicant's evidence, it had apparently done just that. Lord Bridge concluded that the Secretary of State's decisions had been taken on the basis of a misplaced confidence in Kenya's performance of its obligations under the Convention. Since the fact of such breaches in the past was very relevant to the assessment of the danger facing the appellant if he returned to Kenya, and since the decision of the Secretary of State appeared to have been taken without taking that fact into account, it could not stand. Thus, uh, Lord Bridge was not applying some special, more intrusive version of the Wensbury test. Rather, he was following the conventional approach of asking whether the Secretary of State had taken account of all relevant factors. As Lord Diplock had said in the Thameside case, that involves the decision maker not just asking himself the right question, but, quotes, taking reasonable steps to acquaint himself with the relevant information to enable him to answer it correctly. In Thameside, the Secretary of State was held to have acted unlawfully in interfering with an education decision of the local authority on inadequate information. The case had nothing to do with human rights, but I doubt if Lord Diplock would have regarded his own scrutiny of the Secretary of State's action in that case as any less anxious or intense than that of Lord Bridge in Budge Kai. Anyway, whatever Lord Bridge himself intended, the expression anxious scrutiny began to acquire a life of its own in the law. Initially, it was picked up by government lawyers who found it a convenient phrase in seeking to persuade the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg of the effectiveness of uh, judicial review as a remedy for human rights violations under the Convention. By 2002, it was being described by Lord Bingham as a, quote, fundamental principle. It quickly spread beyond cases where the right to life was at stake, as in Bug Day K, to human rights in general, including, for example, the right not to be disturbed in one's home by aircraft noise. Where it applied, apparently, it was supposed to add some sort of potency or rigor to the rationality test. Thus, in a case about interests of vulnerable children, Lord Justice Dyson spoke of the court having, quotes, to consider the issue of irrationality with anxious scrutiny. Now, that might seem an apparent contradiction in terms if he was using irrationality in Lord Diplock's sense. Anxious scrutiny means little if nothing short of the outrageous will qualify for Intervention. Now, by the end of the 1990s, there were attempts to rationalize this more flexible approach in rather more sophisticated language. In Ex Parte Smith, 1996, the applicant was challenging the Ministry of Defense's policy of barring homosexuals from the armed services. David Panic QC, who has played a rather central part in the development of law in this area, in the United Kingdom and, and, and I think in Hong Kong, uh, offered the court an attractive formulation. Distilled, it was said, from Budge K and Brint. 
was adopted by such a, as such by the Court of Appeal. Wensbury unreasonableness was transmuted into, quote, beyond the range of responses open to a reasonable decision maker, but with a new and significant qualification. In the human rights context, there was, it was said, a variable standard of review. The more substantial the interference with human rights, the more the court would require by way of justification under the reasonable of reasonableness test. Now, at the time, David Panic's formula seemed no more than an ingenious way of bridging the gap between Winsbury and Strasbourg in that awkward period in English law after the influence of the European Convention had begun to be felt in our domestic law before the Human Rights Act 1998, which came into force in 2000, had provided an appropriate statutory framework. Once we had the Human Rights Act, it might have been thought, the panic formulation was no longer needed. In the human rights context, at least, we could have moved to a simple proportionality test in accordance with Strasbourg law. However, by this time, the panic variable standard had grown deeper roots. It had apparently become a common law rule of general application, not confined to the human rights context. Thus, in Begbie 2000, Laws LJ refined the Winsbury principle as a uh, sliding scale of review, more or less intrusive according to the nature and gravity of what is at stake. Or as he put it in Mahmoud 2001, is now a, quote, settled principle of the common law, independent of the Human Rights Act, that the intensity of a review in a public law case will depend on the subject matter in hand. Lord Phillips, MR, in 2003, described this process as a development by the courts of an issue-sensitive scale of intervention to enable them to perform their constitutional function in an increasingly complex polity. While they would not retake decisions on the facts, in appropriate classes of cases, they would look very closely at the process by which the facts have been ascertained and at the logic of the inferences drawn from them. The difficulty, of course, was define, to define the appropriate cases. Sliding case scales only work if one has measurable standards to which they can be applied. Otherwise, it's less a matter of sliding scales than to quote Professor Lesueur again, of slithering about in gray areas. Now, in parallel with these developments, from 2000, British judges and advocates were having to learn about the concept of proportionality as specifically applied in the context of European law, and particularly the European Convention on Human Rights, which had by now become of direct application. Now, I need not take time to review this process, since the principles are now well settled and are as familiar to Hong Kong lawyers in the context of the basic law as they are in Europe. Um, Professor Chan explains the concept in his textbook on the, con the HK Constitution, um, it involves the following steps. A, the identification of the legitimate objectives to be pursued by the restriction. B, establishing a rational connection between the restriction and the achievement of one or more of those legitimate objectives. And C, a proportionality uh, test, namely that the restriction must be a proportionate response and must be no more than necessary to accomplish the legitimate purpose in question. Now, the key element in this formulation is the third. The first two steps are, in reality, little different to the Padfield principle that statutory powers must be exercised for purposes relevant to the objective for which they were conferred. So it is the third step which carries the main weight of the analysis. Now, a striking example of proportionality in practice was the recent decision of the Court of Final Appeal here in Con Yoming v. the Director of Social Welfare, I speak somewhat nervously about this since Justice Bakari is here and is in it. But anyway, I'm going to have a go. Uh, <laughs> apologies. A as you all know, um, at issue was a policy by which social security assistance was refused to people who had resided in Hong Kong for less than seven years. This was said to be inconsistent with Article 36 of the Basic Law, under which Hong Kong residents shall have the right to social welfare in accordance with the law. <coughs> it was common ground that any restriction subsequently placed on that right was subject to constitutional review by the courts on the basis of proportionality analysis. Now, the challenge succeeded, and that was in spite, in this case, of Lord Panic appearing as advocate for the director on the other side. 
The court rejected the government's claim that the seven-year requirement pursued the legitimate purpose of its curbing expenditure so as to ensure the sustainability of the social security system. In the absence of any convincing evidence as to the level of savings actually achieved and achievable as a result of adopting the seven-year rule. What I find interesting is the close parallel between um, Justice Ribeiro's explanation of the proportionality test and the variable intensity model of reasonableness review developed by the recent common law cases. Taking his lead from the Strasbourg case law, uh, he distinguished between cases involving fundamental rights or discrimination on grounds such as race, color, or sex, where the court has applied a minimal impairment test subject to the impugned measure to quotes intense scrutiny and requiring weighty evidence that it goes no further than necessary to achieve the legitimate objective in question. By contrast, where the disputed measure involves implementation of the government's socio-economic policy choices regarding the allocation of limited public funds, the court has a duty to intervene only where the impugned measure is, quotes, manifestly without reasonable justification. Now, this case fell into the latter category in which the courts acknowledge a wide margin of discretion for the government. However, even applying that test, and after an exhaustive examination of the justification advanced by the government and the evidence supporting it, the court found that it had not been justified. So one finds really close parallels between the idea that the, the, the idea of variable intense, variable intensity review with intense scrutiny at one level um, in cases where the court has to be satisfied that the measure is manifestly without reasonable justification. Um, and the corresponding uh, approach of under the common law. Now, these parallels between rationality and proportionality were acknowledged earlier this year by a majority of the Supreme Court in a case about freedom of information under the common law rather than the convention. And I should perhaps say that I was one of the dissentients in this case, but not. Uh, I rather took the view that we could reach the same result under um, the Human Rights Act rather than under the common law. But the majority were at pains to emphasize that the incorporation of the European Convention into English law had not restricted the vigor of the common law or its ability to develop its own parallel protections for human rights, and that the remedies provided by the traditional judicial review could be just as effective as those provided by the Human Rights Act. Uh, the case was called Kennedy and the Charity Commission, and the uh, judgments were published um, just a, a month ago. In the leading judgment, Lord Mance uh, um, actually adopted a, an exp exposition of my own of the variable intensity model from a 2004 Court of Appeal case um, in which I had contrasted the high standard of review required in decisions affecting human rights with the low intensity review applied to cases involving issues depending essentially on political judgment or on issues where judges are it's not equipped by training or experience or furnished with the requisite knowledge or advice. Lord Mance continued um, thus, both reasonableness review and proportionality involve considerations of weight and balance with the intensity of the scrutiny and the weight to be given to any primary decision maker's view depending on the context. The advantage of the terminology of proportionality is that it introduces an element of structure into the exercise by directing attention to factors such as suitability or appropriateness, necessity, and the balance or imbalance of benefits and disadvantages. Speaking generally, it may be true, as Laws Jay has said, that Wensbury and European, European Review are diff two different models, one looser, one tighter, the same juridical concept is the imposition of compulsory standards on decision makers so as to secure the repudiation of arbitrary power. But, said Lord Mance, the right approach is now surely to recognize, as De Smith suggests, that it is inappropriate to treat all cases of judicial review together under, under a general but vague principle of reasonableness, and preferable to look for the underlying tenet or principle indicates the basis on which the court should approach any administrative law challenge in 
a particular situation. <coughs> well, that's the latest word on the subject from the uh, English courts. And it seems, almost 30 years after CCSU, that proportionality has crept into the English common law by the back door, not by the explicit addition of a fourth ground to our Lord Diplock's trilogy, as he anticipated, but by the transmutation of Lord Green's strict reasonable test, reasonableness test into something which I suspect neither he nor Lord Diplock would have recognized, a flexible but structured test which is much better adapted to the task of effective and practical judicial supervision of executive action. And that test rarely, whether you call it variable intensity or proportionality, is in practice the same. Now, to complete the circle, um, where does this leave Wensbury? I like to think that the result on the facts would have been different. True it is that the facts of that case do not fit naturally into the rights policy dichotomy discussed in cases I've been considering. Sunday cinema is hardly a fundamental right, but conversely, the decision was not one involving great issues of socio-economic policy on which the authority could show particular expertise or where the courts needed to tread with great caution. It's not clear where it would come in any sliding scale of review. Now, with the help of the Human Rights Act, an English court might analyze it in terms of Article 8 of the Convention as a disproportionate interference with the right to respect for family life, and the right of parents to decide how to entertain their own children. But I would like to think that the common law would have found its own solution. Attitudes may have been rather different in the immediate post-war period, Nowadays, I think we are entitled to expect public restrictions on ordinary life, even on something as mundane as cinema going, to be justified. And what then are the principle? A lot has been said since then about Wensbury. In re recent years, much of it critical. But it has never been overruled. In Daly, 2001, Lord Cook thought the day would come when it would be recognized that Wensbury was a, uh, quotes, unfortunately retrogressive decision in English administrative law. In Absifer, 2003, Lord Justice Dyson had, quotes, difficulty in seeing what justification there is now for retaining the Wensbury test, but he thought that it was for the House of Lords rather than the Court of Appeal to perform its burial rights. Eleven years on, those rights remain unperformed. Now, I started this paper at the beginning of my professional career in 1970. Over 40 years on, I'm now approaching the end. Statutory, sen statutory senility is fixed for me by law at the age of 75, and that's only six years away, um, if I last that long. Now, I cannot, of course, prejudge the cases that may come before us in the Supreme Court or speak for my colleagues. But I would be a little surprised if by the end of that period we have not finally consigned Winsbury to history. Thank you very much. Lord Carnworth, of course, will take questions, even from Nigel Catt, I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's missed this selection. <laughs> Good evening. That's a strong case. Oh, dear, are you here? Yeah. And from me. <laughs> uh, I'd like to ask a question of general uh, uh, concern uh, by the legal profession, and that is the, uh, what do you think about the importance of the protective cost orders for judicial review? Uh, judicial review is very wide-ranging, 
And as we look at the different tests, you can note that these are not very hard-edged principles, and yet judicial review is very often the only weapon with which we can bring the court into uh, a position of putting some limit to a, a government action. So, but uh, understandably, legal aid does not cover all cases, and so sometimes it depends on public-minded uh, lawyers to go on a pro bono basis. But increasingly, also judicial review in application for leave, uh, the court has invited the other party, so it is no longer a quick and inexpensive ex parte hearing. It becomes inter parties, and if you lose, if you don't get leave, then you get to pay the cause on the other side. So in view of this, th this is a very inhibitive um, of uh, judicial review brought in public interest. So in Hong Kong, it seems that although the court does have a discretion uh, not to make a, a course order against the unsuccessful applicant, we, we cannot count on anything of the sort. Mm -hmm. So I wonder um, whether you consider protective course order to be fundamental, to be important, or something that we can do without. Um, <clears throat> well, it's an interesting issue and a difficult issue. Uh, in England, we've developed a system of protective course orders which enable the court to say in advance that if the case the applicant loses, the cost will be limited to a certain amount, usually about £5,000. Um, but the, in the initial cases, it was fairly restrictive, the grounds on which we applied it. But in environmental cases, it's become much more important because we have something called the AUKUS Convention, which applies to Europe and which has as one of its um, basic requirements that people should be able to bring cases environmental matters without uh, a prohibitive costs. And um, the two or three cases have gone to the European Court of Justice on whether the uh, British system complies with that requirement. One went from Ireland and two have come from, from England. And the court held that the, we failed the system. One factor was the uncertainty fact that when you go into a case, you simply don't know what your liability may be at the end of it. And they said that didn't comply with the um, European law. But also, they said that it was necessary that the cost should be both subjectively and objectively reasonable. Um, now, it's not quite difficult to judge what that is. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you have studied European court judgments, but they don't always speak very clearly. We did send a case to Europe to ask whether it, what was the difference and whether it should be subjective or object, objective. And they sent it back two years later saying, well, it was a bit of one and a bit of the other. So, um, so we're doing our best. But I think but what the government has actually recognized the need in environmental cases to bring in a much clearer tests. And so there's a general rule now, applying at least in the first court, that um, environmental cases, the costs are limited um, uh, if you lose for an individual to £5,000 and to a, an organization or company to £10,000. And that's a, a sort of clear, fixed rule. And I think the great advantage of having a fixed sum like that, even if it's a bit arbitrary, is it avoids the need for arguments in advance which may themselves be expensive. Now that's uh, come about in, uh, really because of the pressure of Europe on our system. I we probably wouldn't have done it otherwise. Now, uh, how you can get, I don't know, maybe the final court of appeal could help you on that, I don't know. But I, certainly, I, I, it, what experience shows is that the, the concerned individuals, NGOs, bringing environmental cases in the public interest have been enormously important in all, many countries, in actually having a real effect on environmental control. Yes, uh, thanks a uh, lot, Kanwa, for a very interesting and stimulating talk. Um, it reminds me of also uh, another case in Hong Kong, which uh, one of our audience, uh, uh, Winston Ju, have great personal interest, uh, and it involves the reclamation of harbour. Uh, so that is uh, outside uh, the human rights case. Uh, and 
the, the court managed to, impl uh, uh, to introduce a proportionality test, no difference from the human rights mm -hmm. test, uh, from just one general principle of the protection of harbor ordinance, uh, given the importance of harbors. Uh, and at that time, there was some expectation that this might pave the way of extending proportionality to cases other than human rights case. Uh, it has not happened that way. Um, and so the, um, the, the, the question, therefore, is that, uh, yes, in human rights case, we can clearly see, see the inference of European court and proportionality is probably well established under European Convention or uh, the basic law. But in the more day-to-day -day administrative law type of cases, which involve an exercise of discretion, uh, or in environmental case where you have conflicting social policies coming in, uh, with the prediction that um, while we drop the term when a spray, uh, nonetheless, it will continue to rule us from the coffin. <laughs> um, I suppose the, um, I mean, yes, you're, you're right. It's quite interesting to see this. I mean, what was particularly interesting about the Kennedy case, the recent case I mentioned, uh, although I was not with the majority, I was quite, I was very interested in what they were doing. I think we can build on it in the future, um, is that they were specifically looking at this outside the European human rights context. And the principle that they were seeking to uphold was one of open justice, which was seen as a, a constitutional principle. And so in that context, they were saying, well, we must apply, apply a more intense form of judicial review. So one sort of gets um, a development of actually emphasizing certain things have particular importance. I expect protection of the harbor. I, I heard Vincent talking about that in, in London. It's fascinating and very impressive story. But you know, something which is entrenched in some way as being of particular importance, and you can apply a, a stronger form of review. Because in fact, on the other end of the scale, I mean, what I think was particularly interesting about the, the recent Hong Kong case, Huey, I think, went as well, successfully was um, that although the court was applying a sort of manifest unreasonableness test, it actually was a fairly intensive form of review. And they, uh, you know, if you compare that with what, what actually happened in Wednesday, I mean, they were really looking at the facts. And, and, it, it and I think Justice Bukhari probably went even, even further than the, the majority in some respects. <laughs> <Always. laughs> so um, you know, I can't speak for your courts, but I think it's going to be a, I'm looking forward to my remaining six years in the Supreme Court to see how things develop. I mean, I, what I hope is we will actually sort of develop some rather more clear and more modern principles and not have to go back to CCSU or Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, I just want to follow up with. Uh, this recent Hong Kong case, uh, you mentioned about uh, this test of manifestly without a uh, 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 reasonable fun foundation. Yes. Uh, on the face of it, uh, when I read this uh, 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 phase, it seems that uh, on the face of it, it is no different from Wednesday and reasonableness. Yes. Because if you can satisfy this test of manifestly without reasonable foundation, uh, it seems that we can satisfy also the went to be unreasonable. But in the act, in the way the court of fund will actually apply it, it seems to be more intensive. So can you elaborate more on your uh, view as to whether uh, 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 this is uh, uh, a, a, a test that uh, we should continue to develop or whether really uh, it would simply confuse matter? Because if you come up with there's a lot of uh, uh, new uh, uh, yucksticks. Um, well, I think what I was trying to imply, and whether this will be where we go, I don't know, but that the, is that actually it would be better if we move towards the language of manifestly without reasonable justification, because that's a perfectly valid test. And as we've got to apply it in proportionality context, we might as well apply it in the other contexts as well. But as you say, that on its face, it's you know, not very, very different to the sort of extreme Wednesday. It's not quite judicial outrage, but it's certainly quite a high-level test. And what is, I think, particularly the real difference, actually, is not so much in the legal test which is applied, but the, the, the degree of scrutiny which is put into it. In fact, that the, the 
the court was prepared to look very closely at the government's evidence and say, well, does that come up from scratch? One of the points I was making about Winsbury is that the court didn't seem to think it was even necessary for the authority to explain what they were doing. Um, and so in a way, what, what has been happening, in fact, although the sort of language you've used to describe the test has changed, what we found is that the, the courts have been more willing to look at the evidence. And, and I think that's, I think, I think it's, a, it's a useful development and appropriate. Professor Chen's question. Uh, in the Kong Yuming case, uh, the Court of Final Appeal, with the exception of Mr. Justice Bukhari, has adopted a dichotomy approach in that they divided uh, constitutional human rights into two categories, uh, one are fundamental rights and, and one seems not to be fundamental. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the social welfare rights uh, fall into the latter category. And uh, I wonder what uh, Lord Carver's your view on, on, on this dichotomy approach, is there any comp comparable distinction in England and Wales? And, and is, it, is it a good approach to um, subject human rights into, into two different kinds of uh, uh, scrutiny, even, uh, even though both of, the, uh, both of these categories of rights are constitutionally protected? Well, it's obviously an excellent approach of my, my colleague. <laughs> <laughs> Can speak for himself. I, I, um, I, I think. I mean, I think in reality there are different levels of right. I mean, I think in a way one of the things I was trying to say is that the the sort of anxious scrutiny, which whatever it meant, was was used by Lord Bridge in a context where right to life was in danger. Um, now I think, and it was then sort of gradually extended to aircraft noise affecting people's homes. Now. You know, I, I, I'm afraid I do think that there's a difference between a right to life and a right not to be disturbed when you're sleeping. Uh, and the fact that both are protected under our Human Rights Convention doesn't mean that the courts can't, as a matter of common sense, draw a distinction. Now, whether you can divide into two categories, well, I'll, I'll leave Justice Bukhari to, to develop that. But <laughs> I certainly I think it's unrealistic not to think they're gradations. Thank you, uh, Lord Carnworth, for a very fascinating presentation. Uh, just two very quick questions. Uh, one is a follow-up question on your answer to um, Eric Jones' question. Um, you said that manifestly without reasonable justification might be better wording than manifestly without reasonable foundation. Um, I, I would just like to know, know why. Uh, but my um, second question, um, which is the original question that I, that I wanted to ask is, um, uh, what, what do you think of, uh, outside of human rights, keeping a, a variable scale of standard of review um, so that on some ends we, we would have Wenisbury unreasonable or, or similar wording? Um, on, on, in some other cases, we keep anxious scrutiny or, or similar wording. Uh, and in other cases, something akin to proportionality. Well, the advantage of having a variable scale um, is, of course, it provides um, some legal certainty and predictability to litigants, and also some way of structuring court's reasoning, um, of making sure that there's judicial consistency over cases. Uh, but the disadvantage, um, of course, would be doctrinal rigidity. And, and, and it's very difficult to pigeonhole cases into particular categories, as you yourself have mentioned in your speech. So I was just wondering if you have a view on whether outside of human rights cases we should have a variable, a scale, a sliding scale of standards of review. Um, to deal with your first point, I, I think I wasn't intending to draw a distinction. Or, or what I was trying to say was that the sort of language which is being used in the earlier cases beyond the, the range of reasonable responses and those sort of tests really mean nothing very different from manifestly without reasonable justification. And since that's the sort of formula which is adopted in the proportionality cases, we might as well move to it. I mean, that was my sort of pragmatic suggestion. 
Um, on the second question, <coughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I confess that this, um, the, a previous version of something like this speech that I gave the Administrative Law Bar Association last year had a different end. I, <laughs> um, I ended up basically saying that I thought all this stuff about variable standards and sliding scales was pretty meaningless and we should get off and get along on and decide cases as we thought best or, you know, and try to establish specific tenets and so on. Um, I think but rethinking it and certainly in the light of the, the fairly intense we had discussion we had in the, within the Supreme Court on the Kennedy case, I came to the conclusion that actually the sort of move towards a, a, a variable intensity model outside the human rights context was probably the way to go. And the, but in fact, we would find that we're really, um, it's becoming a proportionality test for the reasons that Lord, Lord Mance gave, which is, is more structured, or actually you can see what you're trying to do, and you can identify when you're adopting a more intense test why you're doing it. So I, I think that we, um, that is probably the way we're going to go. And we will see whether Hong Kong gets there first. And um, you know, I, I think we're at a very interesting time in the development of, of administrative law because I think after my my sort of professional life has seen in a way the sort of growth and development of administrative law, and I think we're now sort of I hope settling down, and um, we'll be very interested to see where we end up. Would I be allowed to uh, ask a quick follow-up? Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any preliminary idea as to how that uh, sliding scale should be devised? So in accordance with the importance of the right or the interest at stake, or in accordance with the institutional competences of, of, the, of, the, of the institutions? Uh, so, so do you have any sketchy idea as to how Well, I think you'll have to wait for the next version of this lecture. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to ask a question about what uh, Dean Chan raised in his preliminary remarks about the um, political context in which all of this happens. And I, I hope not to let Justice Bukhari off the hook here. I hope he might <laughs> give an answer as well on this one. Um, Johannes mentioned the issue of relatively more volatile political environment versus rather more stable political environment in which these types of reviews might take place. And I guess we could argue here in Hong Kong that perhaps we don't even have a functioning political system in some ways, and that surely, surely we're going to be entering into a more uh, volatile political environment, perhaps more intrusive from China, perhaps more democratic, perhaps dysfunctional, we don't know yet, but it's certainly volatile. Uh, so I'd like to ask you both in your careers of doing this type of work, what was the impact of that context? That political volatility versus relative political stability. Um, perhaps there were times in your career, Lord Carnworth, where you considered the political environment rather volatile. That's a int very interesting question, certainly in Hong Kong. and I. I can't pretend that in the UK we have anything quite like this. Um, I mean, the most volatile, well, the most interesting sort of turbulent period in my professional career was actually during the 1980s when um, Mrs. Thatcher, who was a very strong prime minister, was trying to rein in the local authorities' ex expenditure by local authorities. And we had some very interesting, I mean, I find myself both sides of trying to work out what um, <clears throat> what the limits of the local government discretion were. I mean, one very controversial case was in 1970, or nineteen eighty, when um, Ken Livingstone, who you may have heard of, who came in as a sort of um, left-wing mayor of London, with a democratic mandate to cut tube fares by twenty-five percent. And um, uh, which was very popular, not surprisingly. And um, but the unfortunately, it it affected London boroughs differently. And the London borough of Bromley, which didn't have an underground system, was rather myth that it was paying out of its rates for 25% discounts for other parts of London. People like me who live in the centre. 
and, um, and they talk of Keats. And I must say, at the time, I thought that's absurd. It's quite clearly within the discretion of the mayor of London as a newly elected to decide. He has a statutory function to decide on the policy of uh, London Underground. But that went all the way to the, to the House of Lords, who said that that was irrational. And, um, uh, but, and then, um, uh, and th throughout that period of the 1980s, there were these sort of clashes between central and local government. And I think the sort of tests that were applied were rather distorted. But I mean, that obviously bears no relation to what the sort of pressures that you may be under in Hong Kong. Do you want to say something? Well, uh, I don't know what it's like to be a judge in times of political stability. I've never experienced any. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I suppose uh, a judge lives in a place, he hardly notices it. He's aware only of his duty. The duty is perhaps intensified in the case of the Hong Kong judiciary by the fact that uh, we have to maintain the rule of law in the absence of an evolved democracy uh, so that the burden on the courts is heavier and we accept that heavier burden we reject the idea that insofar as we're able to maintain the rule of law in advance of uh, evolved democracy is any excuse for delaying the evolution of democracy, that's all we say. Now, I think the time has come to thank Lord Carnworth for a talk which has exceeded even my high and legitimate expectations. <laughs> um, there's much for him to do. He is quite wrong in thinking that he's only got six years to do it. Uh, he has got plenty of time to do it, I'm sure, as an overseas judge of the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal, in which he'll have no retirement age. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think it's time for... Thank you very much. 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 Thank you very much.